Hello and welcome to the Secular Nation Podcast, brought to you by the Atheist Alliance of America. I am your host, Tim Brannan. My usual co-host, Michael X, could not be here. You just listened to Happiness Writes White by Harvey Danger. Before we get to our guest, as a program note, the Secular Nation Podcast now has its own email address. That's podcast at secularnation.us. So if you're a fan of the show, or even if you hate the show, you can send us an email, and we might read it on the podcast. You get your email read, we get some free content for the show. Everybody wins. Okay, and I'm here today with my guest, uh, Guy P. Harrison, author of the other famous trilogy of books whose titles all start with the number 50. (laughs) Guy, great to have you on the show. Thanks, thanks for having me. Now again, okay, you have your new book out, uh, the... uh, the, the trilogy I'm obviously referring to is your uh, series of 50 reasons to p- people give for believing in God, 50 popular beliefs people think are true, and, and your latest one, 50 simple questions for every Christian. So I think, but before we get into that, I, I thought I'd get more into your background, because, I mean, uh, the stuff I've read about you, like your little autobiographical snippets and the stuff I read on your website, you, I, I get this idea of some sort of, like, Doc Savage, world-traveling adventurer, <laughs> you know? I, I say you even kind of got the name for it. Like, I, I could totally see you, like, on a pulp novel or a serial, like, Guy Harrison and the Golden Temple of Zyosho Mequilexis. <laughs> I wish, man, I wish. Yeah, I, uh, well, my academic background's in history and anthropology. I've always been very, very curious about the world, the universe, uh, science, uh, people, and how weird people are. I mean, we are a bizarre species. We're so we're so capable. We have so much potential. We've achieved so much, yet we're so nutty and just strange, you know? So oh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be on strange frequencies right now to talk about how bizarre we are. So, you know, I mean, this this natural curiosity that I've just always had since childhood has just led me to pay close attention to my species and all the kookiness they get up to, and to always ask questions and to not, I just haven't been afraid to wonder about things and say, well, why do you do that? Well, how do you know that? Why should I believe that? And so my skepticism just sort of grew within me, kind of a natural process. I'm not sure how exactly it happened. And so eventually I got to a point where I I realized from, you know, mainly traveling really and seeing much of the world and talking to many, many people and, and seeing and realizing that, you know, we've got a lot of problems on this planet and many of them could be solved, if not significantly improved, if people were only good skeptics, if people just tried to think like a scientist in everyday life, we could eliminate about 90% of the madness that plagues us. And so this this frustration, you know, this concern for my fellow humans has motivated me to write these kind of books where I'm, you know, I'm not really arguing at people, I'm not preaching at them, I'm just saying, hey, hey, hold on, pause, let's think about this. What is going on? Before you hate, before you kill, before you say no to science and progress, let's think about whether or not maybe possibly you could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I really like about your books is that, like, as much as, you know, books like The God Delusion or not, they sort of profess to be sort of aiming, reaching out towards the believing audience, I, I really feel that there is a genuine, like, outreach in your books toward, towards a believing audience. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I like The God Delusion and other mm-hmm. books like that. I mean, I'm a fan of those books. I'm definitely not opposed to them in any yeah. way. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, and I hope I don't come across as wimpy or too soft, because I think I can be just as strong as anyone. I have many times, you know, confronted very belligerent, stubborn people who are pushing nonsense on others. So I'm not afraid of confrontation or anything. I just try my best to be effective and to really reach people and get into their heads and get them to think for themselves. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm I'm not trying to beat people up and paint them into a corner where they got to admit they're wrong and I'm right. I'm trying to inspire people and to, you know, maybe uh, show them the tools that can help them get on the right track themselves. You know, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to slap people. I'm trying to offer them a hand. I'm, I'm just trying to be a friend. You know, that's the that's the point of my books. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, there's sort of an interesting anecdote I wanted to get into because, all right, when I bought uh, your first, well, book in that series, The uh, Reasons People Give for Believing in God, I was reading it at work, and, you know, I had a Christian friend who was kind of like, oh, that's, you know, could I, I, could I look at that sometime? I'm like, yeah, totally, like, as soon as I finish it. And 
I mean, it never really came to anything, but I, I always kept it in my car. Just like that one day, like if he says, "Hey, Tim, you're just, you still got that book?" I'm like, "Yes, yes, here it is." But uh, <laughs> an interesting thing is because I, I got your the copy of your new book in the mail, and I was at the diner reading it, and like the waitress just came in. I was like, "Huh, that looks kind of interesting. Can I borrow that?" And I'm just like. I have this other book in my car, and I just ran out and grabbed it and I uh, lent it to her. And actually, just if I could go off on, on a tangent, uh, one of the things I think we're sort of losing in uh, the publishing industry is moving from away from the dead tree publishing to the e-books is, you know, we don't have the opportunity to, like, have books and lend them out to people to share that information. Yeah, that's a that's a concern of mine as well. I mean, I, I love the tangible, the physical book. I'm mm-hmm. a book lover, but I also love the convenience, and I love the uh, just the the potential of digital books, e mm-hmm. e readers, and all that. That's a great thing. I'm definitely not against that, but I really love the to just hold a book in your hand. And like you said, one of the best things about a book is you can say, hey, let me give you this gift. I'm handing you something of substance, you know? Yeah. And even if we get to a point where you can easily and uh, you can easily share digital books without freaking out the publishing industry, <laughs> you know, which is a challenge. Um, even then, I mean, you get a, you know, you get a batch of ones and zeros. I don't know. It doesn't feel the same. It's not like yeah. holding a book, you know? And that's one of the, that's one of the selling points of, of these books. I think that's why, one reason they've been successful is that I wrote them in a way where I think any skeptic, any non-believer, anyone who wants to maybe, uh, you know, spark some thoughts in a friend or a family member, somebody they care about, you know, you can hand them one of my books and not worry about really enraging them or, you know, just offending them. I mean, some, yes, I do offend some people, but my God, some people are offended no matter what you do. Oh, yeah. I mean, mo- mo- like the, la- the the current book, the one that just came out, 50 Simple Questions for Every Christian, mm-hmm. that one's not even written as, you know, here's, uh, here's the skeptical argument against all the claims of Christianity. It's not even really like that. I, 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 I position the whole book in a way where this is an explanation of what skeptics are thinking about your religion. If you want to understand uh, two out of three people in the world and understand why two out of three people in the world are not convinced by Christianity, why is it they don't believe Jesus is God and why is it they don't accept the Bible is true? Well, here are 50 of the most common reasons. These are the things that pop up in the minds of skeptics when you're trying to sell them on Christianity. And if you want to understand other people, you know, you need to understand this because unfortunately preachers are constantly, many preachers, not all, are constantly filling Christians with these nonsense ideas about why people reject Christianity. You know, they're, they're angry at God. They just want to be immoral. They're rebellious. You know, all these kind of, you know, uh, standard reasons that the majority of Christians put forward constantly is the reason why there are such a thing as atheists in the world. And of course, non-believers know that's nonsense. We're not angry at a God who we don't, we are not convinced exists. It doesn't make any sense. So I explain these things in the hopes of maybe lessening a bit of the intolerance and prejudice and real stupidity that exists in this canyon between believers and non-believers, because it's really terrible. I mean, I cite many studies in the book that show, you know, for example, the majority of Christians in America uh, don't want, um, they, they would not vote for an atheist candidate, you know, regardless of their policies or background or whatever <laughs> credentials. If they're an atheist, no, not getting my vote. And they are more likely to vote for, say, a gay candidate or a Muslim candidate, even given all the prejudice they tend to have against those people. An atheist is bottom of the barrel, you know, just because they're an atheist. And that's nonsense, you know. They, mm-hmm. they associate... Uh, their religion with morality and think if you don't have their religion, <clears throat> therefore you're immoral by definition, you know, and that, and I address all those problems and try to explain why that is not true. And, and also one study, very disturbing, is that uh, the majority of people in America who believe in a God, which would be Christians, you know, because of America, uh, the way belief breaks down, associate um, atheists with criminals, including rapists, more than they do with any other unpopular group, which is absolutely staggering when you think about that. Just because you're skeptical, you're a critical thinker, and you're not convinced that Christianity is true, even if you have an open mind, you're just, you think the evidence falls short, so you're not convinced, and so by definition, therefore, you're an atheist. Well, that makes you, you know, in league with rapists. I mean, it's crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to just 
enlighten Christians a bit about wh- who who these non-believers really are and what skeptical thinking is really about and how we are not these evil monsters that just can't, you know, we want to rob banks and attack children, so therefore we're atheists. I mean, it's crazy, and I'm trying to uh, hopefully chip away a bit at that. And, you know, if I was a Christian missionary, my this I'm not trying to sell books here, but if I was a Christian missionary, this is the first book I'd read because these are the these are the, the questions you need to answer. You know, if you really want to convince thinking people, if you want to convert thinking people, you've got to meet these challenges and you've got to know what's popping up in the minds of these skeptics. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because again, I think as you said, it's really, you're not really attacking, you're just, you know, you are raising the questions, you know, like what are miracles? Like, uh, there's a lot of chapters I really kind of linked on to when I was reading, like, specifically uh, the one that says, like, what is a Christian? Because to me, that that is kind of the the focal point of the this whole issue of whether or not we're a Christian nation. I mean, obviously we're not, but even if we were, I have to imagine, you know, what about all the Christians that certain Christians don't count as Christians? You know? Yeah. Well, we, we yeah. The the chapter is who is a Christian, yeah, <laughs> and I no. and I just point out the fact that, you know, <laughs> in, in the way you can't really category you can't lump all atheists into one, mm-hmm. you know type of person it's just the absence of belief really and after that you know all bets are off anything goes but for christianity it is it's a hugely successful religion most popular in the world today with 2.3 billion people who call themselves christians and that's impressive in one sense but then another sense not really because there are so many contradictions so many divisions there are more than 30,000 distinct versions of christianity today probably more if you're really nitpicked and if you ask i have talked to these christians if if you ask one group of christians who is a real Christian, they'll say, well, we are, and those people over there are heading straight to hell. They're, they're doing it all wrong. I mean, the, the standard divide, the most common divide is Catholics and Protestants. You know, mm-hmm. Not all, but many, many Protestants say, oh, the Catholics are all a bunch of um, uh, you know, statue-worshipping, um, superstitious, uh, completely, they've lost their way, you know, and they're doomed. They're worshiping the Pope and not yeah. God, and they've got it all wrong, you know. And then Catholics say, oh, no, 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 we are the real Christians. We're doing it as it was done, as it should be done. And these Protestants are some offshoot, and they've completely lost their way. Their allegiances are all wrong, and they could be in trouble one day on Judgment Day. You know, so, I mean, you go on and on and on. And and the thing is, who is really right? The problem for them, of course, is that when, when you're dealing with a belief system that's not based on evidence and logic, but mm-hmm. more on faith and tradition and that kind of stuff and revelation, well, nobody can ever really prove their case fully. You've, you're always going to have conflict and contradiction. And, and so I, I just, you know, and that's one thing in the book, too. I, I I really tried hard not to upset Christians by pretending that they're all the same. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I always am careful about my words. Many Christians, some Christians, most Christians. I, I always qualify and and I make a distinction. I, I I know that not all Christians think the Earth is six thousand years old. You know, um, many do. About forty six percent in America, for example. That's wow. frighteningly large number, but. Uh, you know, I understand some some uh, Christians are not anti-science. In fact, some Christians are scientists. You know, very good scientists. You know, so I, I'm completely aware of this. But it, it's a good bad. It's a good thing and a bad thing with all that diversity. It it it, mm-hmm. it exposes a lot of illogical just contradictions that they need to really address. And it also, you know, diversity is a cool thing. It's good that they're thinking and all, but they need to think more. And that's what I'm trying to encourage. Oh yeah, I, I mean, on that same line, I mean. Can you say, can one truly be a Christian and a skeptic? Sure, sure. In fact, in fact, I incur- I have a, I have, I don't even remember what chapter it is right now, but I think it's, uh, is it rude to even ask? I think I asked this question about the whole question of skepticism and, and Christianity. Mm-hmm. Because unfortunately, many, many Christians, and I, I have bumped into this head first many times, and it just frustrates me so much. They are encouraged, if not forbidden, to think skeptically, to be mm-hmm. critical thinkers. They're told, don't even question that. Don't even go there. You know, some preachers mm-hmm. a- actively warn their congregations against thinking too much, against asking questions. Just believe, just have faith. That's their mantra, you know. And so I'm saying, no, 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 that's completely wrong. And here, here's, here's the angle I took to try to be as productive and helpful as I could. I said, look, you want to be a good skeptic, whether you're a Christian mm-hmm. or not. And if you, if you can't, 
if you can't even conceive of living your life without Jesus and, and, you know, giving up the church and all that, okay, fine. Uh, keep it. If you need it that bad, I say, keep it, hold on to it. No problem. I, I want you to feel good and be happy. And if you're absolutely certain you've got to have it, then keep it. However, you still want to be a good skeptic. Even if you're a good skeptic right up to the doorstep of Jesus, then do it. Because it. who can deny that Christians are not exploited, abused, and ripped off and waste tons of time every day of the year by not being good skeptics? Because within Christianity, there are con artists, there are crooks, mm-hmm. there, are, there are faith healers. And Christ, you know, the majority of Christians agree with me on this. You, mm-hmm. you know, the majority of Christians can watch uh, a typical one of these TV preachers that's saying, you know, give me money. I need more money. You know, mm-hmm. my, these, these jets ain't going to pay for themselves. <laughs> you know, I need your money. Give more, give more. And, and, you know, the majority of Christians in America would probably say, hey, that guy's a crook. You know, well, guess mm-hmm. what? You're being a skeptic right now. You are asking questions, analyzing his claims and saying, you know what? By me sending him 20 bucks and him sending me a little vial of, of miracle water and sprinkling it on my forehead, that probably won't get me a better job, you know, so maybe I shouldn't do it. Well, you're being skeptical. That's a good thing. If some guy says, you know, don't go to the hospital if you got cancer. Come to my crusade tonight and I'll lay hands on you. Forget the chemotherapy. Don't do it. Just come to me. Well, you know what? Most Christians are, are going to go to the hospital, okay? They may pray, but they're going to go to the hospital and listen to what medical science has to say. Now, that's that's critical thinking, okay? You're you're being a skeptic, at least partially. And that's what I encourage. So so Christians, I I, I could not emphasize this any stronger. You want to be, you need to be good skeptics. And mm-hmm. even if you can't, if you can't apply it directly to your God, okay, fine, but apply it to everything else in your life. Because, you know, I don't, I don't care about Christians any less than I care about everybody else. Mm-hmm. I don't want them wasting their money, wasting their time, wasting their good health on, on people who are either nuts or they're just outright crooks. So yeah. I, I want them to be good skeptics too. Yeah, and that, that sort of brings to mind the uh, the recent case with the uh, the Philadelphia couple. Have you heard about that? Uh, they lost another child. Those yeah, guys? yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. I give examples of that. How faith healing. I mean, it kills. You know. I mean, I, I've a previous book I wrote about how alternative medicine, the whole thing. When you're not a good skeptic watch out, you know, no less than Steve Jobs, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, nobody would call oh, him a yeah. complete idiot, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a smart guy, but he, you know, in his, in his final days, he told two, at least two people very close to him, his best friend and his biographer, mm-hmm. he told them, Hey, I blew it, you know, by trusting in mm. a bunch of new age, alternative medicine nonsense, I wasted valuable time that I probably could have, I probably had a good shot of having, you know, the real doctor save my life and yeah. it's too late. I blew it. You know, because he wasn't a good skeptic at that moment in his life. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of my view of uh, the uh, alternative naturopathic, homeopathic medicines. Is you know, a lot of these the advocates will cite some alleged malfeasance by uh, pharmaceuticals or modern, <laughs> right, you know, right. which may right. or may not be accurate. But again, they're saying the solution is to you know get rid of you know the actual scientific verification. Like the, the way I see it, it's. They're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They're throwing out the baby, keeping the bathwater, and then diluting the bathwater a million times and selling it as a contraceptive because the water has <laughs> memory and it remembers the baby and like your yeah. life. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I could, couldn't agree more, man. It's 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 terrible because, yeah, I you know – in, f- in my book, 50 Popular Beliefs That People Think Are True, I have a chapter on alternative medicine, and I talk about how – you know, you've you've got to you know you just brought up one. You've got to yeah. you got to think what these people are saying. Just mm-hmm. because they cite a few examples of people who took a potion and got better doesn't mean anything. You need proper double-blind scientific testing. Just because somebody said, "Oh, medical science is lame," you know, the healthcare industry sucks. My doctor doesn't pay any attention to me. He treats mm-hmm. me like I'm a car in for an oil checkup or something. You know, mm-hmm. checking my oil. It's horrible. Yeah. So I, I, you know, yeah, all those things are right. You're right. Modern healthcare sucks, you know. Mm-hmm. Insurance companies are ripping us off. Uh, yeah. Pharmaceutical companies are, you know, a lot. Many of them are sleazy scumbags who care more about profit than saving human lives. Sure, absolutely, I agree. But that doesn't mean you go run to a witch doctor and drink some herbal potion that's going to cure you. You know, mm-hmm. you still got to stick with medical science because time has proven, history has proven, medical science actually works. It's not perfect, absolutely not perfect, but it works better than anything else we have. 
Absolutely. So it's same with prayer. I mean, you get, I have a chapter on prayer and mm-hmm. faith healing in, in the, this book. And, you know, I, I just point out, you know, it's so easy for us as humans to be led astray, confirmation bias, faith and tradition, listening to authority figures, all these kind of things. They, they set us up to fall for things like prayer heals, prayer works. Um, the faith healer healed me. I feel better. You know, I explain how these things almost surely are really working and how almost certainly it's not because of supernatural magical things happening. And, and, you know, one one tone throughout all my books as well, I'll just add real quick is that uh, I'm sympathetic with people who believe this because they're just being humans. You know, these are not dumb people. These are not, you know, idiots we should be scoffing at and looking down at. Not at all. You know, we're Mm -hmm. all in this boat together as humans. We all have human brains that are susceptible to this nonsense that are, that can easily fall prey to these, these side streets of madness. You know, it's nothing special. Yeah. And being a good skeptic, the first step is just acknowledging I am a human with a human brain. Therefore, I've got one foot in fantasy land already, and I need to start thinking better or I'll be in trouble the rest of my life. You know, that's all it is. Yeah, well, that, that's one of the things I kind of see in the, the specific skeptic, not necessarily atheist atheist community, that there's sometimes a resistance towards uh, talking about religion when we talk about skepticism. Yeah, not, not me, man, because, I, you know, I, I address that as well. A lot of skeptics, they... They go, you know, they're wicked, they're brutal when it comes to UFOs and Bigfoot and the psychics, you know, they knock them down, knock them down. But then they come to religion, well, you know, that's a little too personal, we don't want to go there, you know, mainly because they're afraid of getting beat up by the the pack, you know, the posse, Mm -hmm. which outnumbers them, you know, and I, believe me, I, more than most, I understand that concern because I've been outnumbered all my life, you know, as a person who's been skeptical of religious claims, you know, whether I'm in the Middle East or I'm in India or I'm in Africa or I'm in the Caribbean or I'm in the United States, I'm always outnumbered everywhere I go. (laughs) So I, I understand that. However, I, you know, I just think you've got to go that extra step and you've got to be consistent and you've got to apply skepticism everywhere. That's the, that's the ideal good skeptic is one who doesn't stop anywhere. You keep asking, you keep asking questions, you keep demanding evidence, you keep wondering and you keep doubting because that's, that's, you know, the, the moment you become inconsistent is the moment you get a little vulnerable and something might creep in on you. So you need, you need to do it. You really do. And I, I think, like I like I mentioned earlier, you know, why why wouldn't I keep going with my skepticism? Because I don't care about religious people any less than I do everybody else. I mean, people who believe in UFOs, you know, and they're yeah, you know, or somebody who's a somebody who believes in psychics and is blowing five hundred bucks a month on some psychic, you know, to yeah. tell them things about themselves they already know and to make up stuff about their future. I mean, that's you know, that's tragic, and I'm going to encourage that person to rethink what they're doing. But why why would I not also encourage somebody who's given five hundred dollars to their local church when maybe they're struggling and they're not you know, Mm -hmm. uh, supplying their children with the things they need. Maybe they. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. You lose me? Oh, what up? You you just kind of cut off for a second. I don't know. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Anyway. Yeah. So skepticism should not stop at religion's doorstep. I mean, one a skeptic should not care any less about religious people than they do everyone else. And by the way, any skeptic who says, well, you know, uh, religion is such a personal and such a passionate topic that we don't really want to upset them and it's impolite to go there. So let's just stick to UFO believers and psychics and all that. Well, that doesn't make sense either because I have met people who believe in UFOs or believe in ESP or believe in psychics just as passionately as someone else may believe in Jesus or the Quran or something. Mm-hmm. So you could be offending and upsetting someone by doubting UFO sightings just as much as you would by doubting prayer or faith healing. So that doesn't really work anyway. So I say push skepticism anywhere and everywhere you can with anyone you can because you're doing them a favor by doing so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the classic skeptical issues like UFOs and ghosts and uh, Nostradamus, like, I mean, other than, like, the psychic, they, they don't really require any kind of investment. So it's, it's sort of easy to just, you know, offhandedly criticize. But when it's actually something that, like, affects the lives of millions of people every day and that they put all this money and time and effort and energy into it, you know, I mean... I'm not going to say it's never happened, but I, I've never heard of, like, a father uh, re- disowning his son because he doesn't believe in Bigfoot, you know. 
<laughs> I don't know. It could happen, though. Things yeah. could happen. I've seen, I've seen, I mean, absolutely agree with you. However, I've crossed paths with some people who are very, very passionate about their belief in mm-hmm. magic or, or even UFOs or, you know, alien abductions, that kind of thing. So you can find, you can find passion and commitment anywhere, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to these irrational beliefs, you really can. Mm-hmm. But you're right. If very few wars have been launched over Bigfoot beliefs. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a difference. Religion is a much, much greater challenge than, uh, yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. even the people who are, like, passionate about UFOs, they're still sort of, like, the outliers. I mean, yeah. there's just people you meet every day, and it's like, yeah, I believe in not UFOs or whatever, but, you know, there's not this big structure that's saying you have to right. believe in UFOs. You know, well, right? give, give them 2,000 years, and we'll see. <laughs> Maybe there will be. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've already got Scientology, which is could be interpreted as a UFO religion. Mm-hmm. It really could be in some yeah. aspects. Or the Realians, actually. Have you heard right. of the Realians? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're a bizarre, bizarre religion by this uh, ex-French race car journalist guy who, <laughs> you know, encountered aliens who took him up in their ship, and he had an orgy with aliens and robots or something yeah. like that, and he came back to tell the world to live in peace as a result. But they, uh, that's fascinating, you know. They've yeah. got their little thing. I don't think they have very many followers, but yeah. you never know. Give them a couple even, of thousand years. Even Mormonism, kind of, because, I mean, they're all... F- on this planet called yeah. Kolob. Right, right. But, you know, I, that's sort of the thing I kind of find funny about these sort of more recent religions that have a sort of more, like, sci-fi story than uh, the, uh, you know, the older religion, like the Bible and whatnot. I kind of just see that as almost like a natural progression because, you know, yeah. we're sort of incorporating a uh, broader uh, knowledge base. Yeah, for absolutely. For the people who formulate those religions. Yeah, plus, you know, in the 21st century, it's a little more appealing to many people, especially younger mm-hmm. people, if, you're, if your claim has a little bit of a high-tech, science-y edge to it, you know, that it might be more appealing to a certain segment of society. It's interesting. That's why I think, you know, Carl Sagan pointed out mm-hmm. that... Uh, these alien abduction claims, you know, people have all of a sudden got, you know, aliens coming into their bedrooms and immobilizing them and taking them away for experiments or doing stuff through them right in bed or molesting them, you know, right there <laughs> in their bed. And he, he pointed out that, you know, this story has been around for thousands of years, but it used to be, you know, succubi or witches or the yeah. old hag or these demons that would come into your room and do the same stuff. But now it's aliens and spaceships coming in. It sounds like it's the same sort of, you know, dream nightmare sleep paralysis type phenomena that has just been updated for our you know modern scientific age so it sounds a little more believable yeah i i heard some or actually might have been from your book actually that you know before like sort of roswell and we had this like broad idea of this the gray alien with the big eyes like people had alien abductions but they were like much broader in description, you know, like little green men or things with antennas or something. And it wasn't until, like, we had this, like, this, like, general idea of what an alien is. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's culture. That's that's when culture kicks in and everybody gets on the same page and starts following the same, the same script, you know. Yeah. It goes back to the uh, the couple that were abducted, I think, in the late 50s, I think it was, or early mm-hmm. 60s, and uh, or claimed to have been abducted and experimented on. And their description sort of grew and became popular, and Hollywood kicked in, and everybody's now they've all, you know, it's just a cultural convergence of, yes, the the standard alien is supposed to be a little guy with a big head and big huge eyes. <laughs> it's just interesting. So now when there's a sighting, you know, or an encounter, it, chances are it's going going to be that sort of you know look to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things you do uh, you touch uh, going back to the uh, the simple questions book. I think you do uh, touch on the the historicity of Jesus. If we can sort of go on that, I I think. Uh, I've sort of talked about this on my own uh, private circles a lot. One of them, one of the arguments I keep hearing is that there are no historians who doubt the uh, historicity of Jesus or something like that. I've heard that a lot. I haven't heard that like properly refuted. Have you heard of anything like that? Oh, I'm sure you could find some historians who do. I yeah. mean, yeah. But the thing is, if if you're talking about the question of was Jesus a god, a mm-hmm. god man, yeah. or was he, you know, a human who just you know, influence some people and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, made an impact and got the ball rolling or something. That's a, it's a very valid, important question and it should be investigated. It should be debated, yeah. but I'm, you know, to be honest, I mean, I'm not so interested in that question because I don't think it really, it gets to anything because, okay, 
so what if he was just a man? You mm-hmm. know, so what if he was a god? Yeah, what what we need to know the 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 answer to that is what was he a god? That's the que- that's the question that matters. Was mm-hmm. he a god? Because that's what every Christianity is based completely on that. Mm-hmm. If he was just a guy, mm-hmm. or if he didn't exist at all, and this is somehow a conjured up religion by people at the time or co-opted from other religions as some suggest. Mm-hmm. Well, we got we got to we got to figure that out, you know, that's interesting and all, but so what? You know, what I want to know is was he a god or not? Is the evidence mm-hmm. there that a god named Jesus, you know, the god came to earth and walked around in human form, you know, in flesh and blood and his name was Jesus. That's what we need to know. And what I point to is the evidence for that is is, you know, severely lacking that's the problem so i don't really you know i I don't get too bogged down in that because i just stick to the bigger issue the bigger questions you're telling me christianity is real and true and that if i don't follow jesus and believe in him i will burn in hell forever and that's the only way to heaven is through this god as he claimed here in the bible well wow that's a huge claim you know let's Mm. look into it let's look at the evidence let's let's see if the logic holds together that's that's the route i always take so I, I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't get into the thing, the whole thing of what, cause I, you know, if I've looked into the whole God versus just a man kind of thing and it gets frustrating at some point because you can't really prove it either way. I don't think yeah. you can't really prove he was just a guy. All you can do is show doubts about him being a God. Mm-hmm. You can, you can show reasons for doubting, but I, it, it's just because of the time he, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a Royal. He wasn't some rich guy. He mm-hmm. wasn't a big military general. There's just no historical records of his yeah. existence as a human being, but that doesn't mean he didn't exist as a human being, you mm-hmm. know, to take the Christian side of it. Okay. It doesn't, I mean, we shouldn't expect for there to have been a lot of historical records for this kind of a person who was kind of living a humble life. He wasn't a big deal. He wasn't Alexander the great. He wasn't one of these kinds of people. So, you know, that, that void there. And then, however, you know, I'm honest about it. I'm fair to Christians. I say, well, you know, there was this crater there in history where this guy made an impact. So, you know, maybe there was a a real guy in the center of it, a real human Mm -hmm. being who stirred it all up and got it going. You know, I don't know, maybe so I'm willing to accept the possibility, you know, that's fine, but who cares? I'm more interested in was this guy a god? Was he mm-hmm. really a magical being that ruled, you know, actually, remember the Holy Trinity, Jesus was God the Father too, the same thing, and yeah. the Holy Spirit. So was this Jesus guy who was walking around in the Middle East, was he actually the creator of the universe and he knew the future and he knew, all, you know, was he really this being? Well, wow, that's a big claim and I need lots of evidence and I don't <laughs> see lots of evidence. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, that's... <clears throat> but I always say, like, even if we could, like, de- like go back in time and actually see Jesus, and, he- and even, like, maybe see him performing miracles, I always think, oh, could we even really prove that it was actually God, or just, you yep. know, he could have been just, he- like, well, he could have been, you know, a... Uh, the Prestig- David a uh, prestigitator, yeah. or but but yeah. even then, you know, uh, even yeah. if we have to say the only explanation is a supernatural one, then you know that just kind of like ushers in the whole plethora of other potential supernatural. You know, he could be a wizard or a yeah. alien, time lord, or something. Yeah, no, he could be an advanced alien with technology yeah. we don't understand. But mm-hmm. yeah, I have a chapter on that in the book. I, I say, how can we be sure about uh, miracles? I have one on miracles in general, and mm-hmm. explain how they're you know regular real events are so often misinterpreted and how unknown events are so often embraced as necessarily being magical just because we don't understand them. But I also have a chapter on the miracles of Jesus. And I explain just what you're bringing up there. And I say, okay, let, let's go ahead and assume, uh, let's agree that this guy was walking around and doing these wonderful magic tricks and healing people and stuff. Well, you know what? People are doing that today. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been to a Benny Hinn crusade. I've been to one. I've stood right before the stage and watched Benny Hinn cure people of AIDS, you know, hepatitis. Mm-hmm. I've seen it before my eyes, you know, or maybe I didn't. Maybe there's another explanation for what was going on, you know, and I've, you know, I've been to magician shows, you know, David Copperfield. Imagine if we transported David Copperfield, the magician, back to Palestine 2,000 years ago. Do you think he might get a following and convince some people that he's, you know, a miracle maker? I mean, I think he could. He would make, you know, camels disappear and stuff like that. And people would be like, whoa, oh, you know, this guy must be a god. It would be easy to do. In fact, Mm -hmm. we have a modern, we have a current 21st century example of this 
every day in India. There's a big problem with these men in India that go from village to village. They're called godmen or these gurus. Ah. And they're just con artists. They go from village to village and they do, you know, these dime store magician tricks and they they freak out the local people who who think, wow, you know, these guys are magic. They they know what they're doing. And then they'll, you know, they'll bring their children to them who are having headaches or acting weird or something. And the magic man, you know, does a, you know, hocus pocus, blows dust in their face or whatever and cures them. And then they collect a bunch of money and they head on to the next village you know they're just taking advantage of poor people and the same thing happens now i don't think christians who believe in the miracles of jesus would say you know they would have any problem saying well these guys are frauds in india who are doing this these godmen in india are just scam artists you know they're magicians tricking these poor rubes you know well how do we know this wasn't happening back then and you know it it, it was happening back then. I don't know about the case of Jesus, but it was. People were going around doing, quote, miracles, unquote, all the time. But it was really just, you know, simple tricks, and people were just gullible. They weren't scientific thinkers. They weren't skeptics. They didn't know any better, and they fell for it. Yeah. Like, and that's, well, I've actually, like, I've talked to someone about that, like, in a uh, online discussion, and, well, well, he was actually saying, well, you know, well, there were wizards back then, too, so, like, they could have just been powered by demons themselves, or, you know, like, because even, like, in, in uh, Exodus, where uh, Moses, uh, he is challenging, like, the magicians of uh, the Pharaoh turning uh, snakes into sticks into snakes or something like that. Yeah. You know, you know one thing I, and I point out in the book is that people who use these supernatural, who claim supernatural causes for stuff, miracles, you know, it was God or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it also gets to the whole intelligent design versus evolution thing or the uh, creationism versus evolution thing. Um, just saying it's a miracle or God did it is not an explanation, you know, and they try to, they try to balance that against the claim that a scientist will make and say, no, no, it's nature. But that's not a fair equation. It's not a balanced, you know, comparison because the scientist says, doesn't just say nature did it. A scientist says it's a natural cause and here's how and explains what happened, the mm -hmm. actual process of the hurricane or the earthquake. You know, the earthquake, the, the ground shook because there are mm -hmm. tremendous forces under the ground and big slabs of rock shifted position, you know, suddenly, and that's what an earthquake is. It was a fault, you know, a crack in the earth here. And they explain it. They don't just say, and, and yet when you get to miracles, well, how did life, you know, change and how did, how did life start? Oh, God did it. It's, that's not an explanation. Miracle, not an explanation. Explain how he did it. You know, that is an explanation. And that's why, you know, I point out in the chapter on creationism, intelligent design, I point out, imagine if Charles Darwin put forth a theory 150 years ago and just said, nature did it, mm -hmm. you know, end of book, the origin <laughs> of species, nature did it, end of yeah. book. I mean, that would be nothing. It would be meaningless. And yet that is what religious people try to do when they explain things that happen and things that have happened. They say, God did it, mm -hmm. end of book, case closed, you know, yeah, and that, I, that's, that's, it's not the same thing. It's not, it's not an explanation. It's not at all. I mean, you need to explain what happened. Yeah. Same problem you find with uh, ESP and psychics and mm -hmm. stuff like that. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, I can read mine. Something's going on. Really? Well, explain it. What is your theory yeah. of psychic readings? Explain the, explain what's going on in your head and my head, or explain how your how a medium is talking to dead people. Let's 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 work this out. How are the uh, how's the information? traveling across time or through a dimension explain this please you know they don't mm -hmm. do it don't even try yeah i mean again i'm when i whenever i'm posed with you know god created i was like how did he create the universe you know how what did he make it out with what tools did he use like how did he acquire the knowledge to create a universe and that's kind of yeah yeah i mean curiosity whether you believe or not you know if, yeah. if he, okay fine you even if you're determined never to become an atheist that's fine but mm -hmm. Still, don't stop being curious. Explain yeah. why, you know, how, how did um, how did God cause this earthquake? How mm -hmm. did he, you know, what did he send some sort of magic beam from heaven that struck, mm -hmm. you know, the San Andreas fault and made the earth shake? Or what, how, what is the process? What is going on? You know, I want to know. Why yeah. would you be curious? I mean, just any claim for the supernatural, I mean, it's basically, I mean, 
I don't believe I don't believe in the supernatural, especially because you know if there was is anything out there, if we were ever to demonstrate that it exists, it would cease to be supernatural. It'd just be a previously yeah. non understood uh, aspect of the supernatural of the natural world. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, man. You're exactly right. Su- supernatural is just it's one of two things. Anything that somebody says is supernatural is one of two things. It's either something we haven't figured out yet and don't understand mm-hmm. the natural reasons for it, or it's made up nonsense that doesn't exist and never will exist. Mm-hmm. Supernatural is one of two things, you know? Yeah. And even 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 if some sort of a god or gods do exist, well, I would still say, okay, they're part of the universe, then therefore they're natural, and one day maybe we'll figure them out and understand them. You know, so yeah, it's still, it's not supernatural. Uh, just getting back on just the, the general subject of the, the your trilogy of the uh, 50-something books, like, did you feel that when you, do you feel there was, like, progression from, like, one to these for believing in God to popular beliefs to uh, simple questions for Christians? Yeah, there was, the first one I wrote was 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God. And that one sort of grew out of my world travels because mm-hmm. I, I talked to many Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians in many different places and many different you know, social strata. And so I, one of the things I observed is that, you know what, regardless of what these people believe, they all seem to be reaching into the same – they all – is that you? You okay? Yes, I think oh. that's my smoke detector. It oh, does okay. that. It's going to do that uh, two more times. <laughs> All right. You want me to keep going? Yeah, just keep going. Okay. okay. Uh, but with the book 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God grew out of my world travels in the sense that I noticed something common among people who believed in a god or gods, regardless of what those god or gods were and what, what the religion was. So Hindus, Muslims... Um, Christians, they're all giving me the same justifications for belief, even though their religions are totally contradictory and they can't all be right. So, for example, they'd be saying, well, the world is just too complex. It it can't have just happened on its own. It can't just be nature. The the world is too complex. So, therefore, I know that Allah is real, Muhammad is his prophet, and the Quran is absolutely true. And yet, if I'm in Africa talking to a Christian, they might say, they did say, well, look at the complexity of the world. Look how beautiful the world is. It's so complex. It has to be God. And therefore, I know Jesus is real, and I know the Bible is absolutely true. You know, and then, you, and then you go to, you know, I'll speak to Hindus who say, well, I know the gods of Hinduism are true and real because we prayed and my uncle was healed. He was deathly sick. He was going to die. The doctor said he had no chance. We prayed and Ganesh healed him, and he's healed. So I know Ganesh is real. He's a real God. And yet when I go to Jamaica and I'm talking to Christians, they say, well, we prayed to Jesus, and my aunt was cured of her cancer. So we know Jesus must be must be real. You know, can't be it out. And so that book, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God, is a sort of generic skeptic's response, not generic, but a a skeptic's response to these common justifications for belief that one hears around the world in many different religions. And then 50 popular beliefs that people give for, that people think are true is my skeptical take on 50 of the most popular, what I consider to be unlikely to be true claims, you know, and they're all in there, UFOs, psychics, ghosts, haunted houses, alternative medicine, you know, medical quackery, um, doomsday predictions, end of the world stuff, all, it's all in there, and that was a fun book to write, by the way, Mm -hmm. I really enjoy that, because these things are, even if they're not true, they're fun to think about, you know, they really are, I love, like, cryptozoology and Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster, I mean, I love that, you know, and and the thing is, in the, the, the tone I took with that book, the, the direction I took is not to debunk and say, no, no, this is stupid, you know, don't believe in Bigfoot, you know, here's the reasons why it doesn't make sense, you know, what I would do is, I would, I would give the reasons for doubting the Bigfoot claim and, and explain why it's very unlikely that Bigfoot is real. But then I would say, hey, if you're attracted to finding monsters, you know, unknown creatures, if you're attracted to cryptozoology and you think it's cool, well, you know what? That's, a, that's, a, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But hey, consider this. 
science is doing it. They're actually searching for monsters right now in the oceans, in the Amazon, you know, and they're finding new insects, new microbes that are absolutely freaky. You know, we, the, the deep ocean is so, so, uh, so much of a mystery still to us. Who knows what's down there? You know, that's the game you want to get on. That's where you want to look. You know, you can't, you can't dip a net in the ocean without finding some new kind of weird, bizarre microbes that have never been, you know, seen or named yet by science. That's what you want. That's the game you want to be in on. So, you know, don't give up on reality. Don't start going for all these freaky, unlikely things. You know, who, who cares about ghosts? when and mediums when parallel universes might be real you know mm-hmm. check out the math and the science on that you know is that freaky parallel universes you know trillions infinite number of universes all around us i mean that is bizarre you know if you're if you're into if you're into freak finding freaky creatures and beings well check out astrobiology the search for extraterrestrials you know mm-hmm. that is amazing the extremophiles right here on earth the weird mm-hmm. places that creatures live and exist and then after that I I uh, wanted to write a book specific to Christianity because my first book that dealt with the religion was very general and just reached kind of any religious people. And Christianity is, you know, the world's most popular religion. It's so popular, has so much of an influence. And unfortunately, there's so much negativity, so much prejudice and hate that comes out of Christianity, even though many, most Christians are very good people, very, mean well, they want well. Uh, They want well for the world. They want peace. You know, they just want to raise their families, do their job and be good people. I mean, that's, you know, most Christians are like that. But still, you can't deny that Christianity really does cause a lot of problems. It really does. You know, you only have to look at the fact that 46% of American adults think the world is 6,000 years old. I mean, that is you know, stunningly ignorant. That is horrible. And it's an offshoot of their Christian belief. And, you know, that's a danger for the world and for for America and for the world is when you've got people that are taking these anti-science stances and refusing to budge, you know, because they think their God demands it of them. That is scary. That is a really bad place for the world to be. And so I'm, I'm trying to address these kind of things in a productive, positive way that hopefully Christians will at least give some consideration to. Yeah, so I mean, well, are are you thinking of doing a fourth fifty something something book? <laughs> well, yeah. You, by by the way, I had different names for all these, mm-hmm. and my publisher insists on the fifty time ty- fifty uh, title. Yeah. My, my my publisher is the numerologist obsessed with numbers, <laughs> not me. Okay? Yeah, okay, but anyway, yeah, definitely. There's always one. I mean, I just finished a book called Think. Which is which is a really cool book. This one comes out in October, November, and it's for everybody. And it's an explanation of how to think clearly in everyday life, how to think like a scientist. Real practical advice, real step by step instructions for how to wade through all the madness and mm-hmm. crooks and nonsense out there, and also how to eat right, how to stay active, these kind of things to keep your brain healthy and functioning mm-hmm. well. And so that's a cool book. That one comes out, and after that. I've got a few ideas for some books, but one I probably will write. It might, it's, I think it's about number two or three in the queue right now, but it's probably 50, something like 50 simple questions for every Muslim. Oh, so wow. I want to, yeah, I want, I want to address Islam and just mm-hmm. point out the, you know, the same basic skeptical questions and, and, you know, although that may be the one book that gets me in trouble, I hope it yeah. doesn't, you know, <laughs> but I mean, I don't know, you know, cause, but I, yeah, I'll just avoid no, no cartoons of Muhammad on the cover, nothing like that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can get away with it, but I think definitely, you know, the Middle East, I mean, I've been there and there's wonderful people. I mean, I've been to Jordan, I've been to Syria, I've been to Egypt, wonderful, wonderful people there. And like, you know, like I said about Christians, you know, I don't care about, I don't care about Muslims any less than I do anybody else, you know, so Mm -hmm. I want them to be good skeptics too. And I want them to lead safer, more efficient lives through skepticism. So why not write a book for them too? So, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I plan to do it. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to read that just because, you know, again, I, I don't know all that much about uh, Islam. So I think that might actually be a great, you know, educational tool for non-Muslims as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All all my books are written for skeptics as well, for non-believers as well, because I think it presents a way, uh, effective ways that, uh, ways that skeptics and non-believers can, you know, 
have productive dialogue with believers and not just argue with them. And, you know, and, and even my book on UFOs and Bigfoot and that stuff, I point out that it's not enough to just say, ah, your claim doesn't make any sense. You don't have any evidence. Shut up. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't get you anywhere. You need to understand. Like if you want to, if you want to confront or interact with a Roswell UFO crash believer, it's not enough to say, ah, you can't prove it case closed. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. You're not going to impress them with that. But if you can tell them about Project Mogul and you can say, hey, you know what? You're right. There was a government cover up at Roswell. You're right. There was some top secret, you know, shenanigans going on. You're absolutely right. And you're right. Something did crash there. But guess what? It was Project Mogul. It was a <laughs> it was a Cold War top secret program for listening to Soviet uh, nuclear tests halfway around the world with these high altitude, you know, balloon air structure things. And you're right, it wasn't just a weather balloon like the government said. They lied. You know, when you can explain that, you're probably going to get further with a Roswell believer than if you just said, ah, you're stupid. That's mm. it. Yeah, you know, and this, it's the same with same with you know Muslims, Hindus, Christians. If you want them to really think more. Uh, you know, more scientifically, if you want them to be good skeptics, you're going to have to reach them on a level far beyond just saying, ah, you can't prove your God's real. Shut up. You know, that's <laughs> not going to work. Not going to work. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a, gr I've had a great experience here talking with you uh, this afternoon. I, uh, I definitely look forward to uh, that, uh, what's that, uh, think, uh, why should you, why you should question everything. Yeah, I'll make sure you get a copy. I'll send you a copy, man. Awesome, that's great. And all right, and uh, okay. Uh, so this has been uh, Guy P. Harrison, author of uh, Fifty Simple Questions for Every Christian, as well as Fifty Popular Beliefs People Think Are True and Fifty Reasons People Believe in, Give for Believing in God. These in are all a god. Let me correct you there. In a god. god. A yeah, god, of course. not specific. Yeah, could yeah. be anybody's god. God or not, gods. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that that book is for anyone and everyone who believes in gods. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Tim, thank you so much for having me, man. It's the pleasure, pleasure was all mine. You know, I... oh, thanks. Keep up the good work. Keep asking good questions. You know, keep doing interesting shows, okay? All right. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye. Okay, you too. This has been the Secular Nation Podcast. Michael X is our technical director. Our executive producer is Tom Alchiori. And I, of course, am your host, Tim Brannan. You can email us at podcast at secularnation.us. This podcast is brought to you by the Atheist Alliance of America. If you would like to become a member, you can go to our website at atheistalliancemerica.org. Click on the support tab and hit membership. This is Tim Brown of the Secular Nation Podcast, signing off.